Hi, um, I'm Peter Bradley from uh, Worcester State University. My three co-workers here were graduate students. Um, Adrian Smith has continued working on this project for many years and has become a very valuable colleague. So we're working at a site that's been pretty much like this since the end of the last ice age. This is Powderwater Pond, and uh, over this side there is a quaking bog, which means vegetation, uh, sphagnum moss developing over water. So when you walk on it, it's a quaking bog, and you sort of walk around like this. Over. What have I done? <laughs> over on this side, um, the peat is solid, and uh, we have taken a core from this location, and uh, there's at least five meters of solid peat. I'm uh, not doing this very well. At uh, the location where the camera is. So this is the location of the study site, and uh, it's in central Massachusetts, near to Worcester. It's a 20 minute drive for us, so it's a very good site for us to take our students. And uh, we've been encouraging both undergraduate and graduate student projects at this site. At one point, this site was declared a national natural landmark, and that's their map there. And uh, that mainly came about because of the efforts of Ed Schofield, who was a Worcester area botanist. And uh, he made a good deal of effort to, uh, to get that designated as a natural, um, a national natural landmark. There's woods surrounding the pond, and uh, there's a good access site. So if anybody wants to visit, visit this location, please contact me and I'll give you some tips on how to get in there. Uh, at this access site, uh, there is this notice, and uh, a boardwalk has been placed on top of the sphagnum moss. So you can walk out onto the moss and uh, not get your feet too wet. <laughs> But it is possible to fall in if you stray off the boardwalk. I've done it. <laughs> and uh, we have a rule at Worcester State uh, that nobody goes out there on their own. It's a good idea. Anyway, um, the sphagnum moss is shown at the top there. Uh, there's between 30 and 40 centimeters of this. A uh, very spongy horizon, if you like. Uh, the colors vary from greens through reds. You also see below there some pitcher plants. It's a very interesting plant, Saracenia purpurea. And uh, one of my colleagues at Worcester State is interested in the ecology inside the pitcher. So she's been culturing bacteria and uh, so on. These are carnivorous plants, they can break down insects. I've also done uh, some protease assays on the fluid that's in the pitcher plant. Um, so we're interested in how the insects are being broken down. There was one point where we borrowed a core borer from the foster lab at Harvard Forest. And if you haven't used things, things before, there's a, a chamber about 50 centimeters, push it into the ground, you turn it and trap a sample, you pull it out, and then you start adding all of those extension rods. So the core we collected uh, is more than five meters in length. We carefully labeled it, took it back to Worcester State, and uh, started culturing bacteria from out of the core. Another thing that we did was have 10 
uh, radiocarbon dates uh, down on the core. The curve there, which is the dashed line, is the raw data. It's usual, however, uh, to calibrate radiocarbon data and refer it to the reference date of 1950. So the other two curves here are two different methods that are used to calibrate the data. They are from observations on living organisms. The basal date, uh, keep pressing the number. The basal date is 8,500 years old. Uh, so that's how we did the dates before. And uh, if you know the depth, then we know the date. Now uh, we've changed to another approach, um, which uh, is the way we're doing it now. Uh, so it's a slightly different curve, but it's the same idea. Here you've got five meters depth, and here you've got the age going down to about 8,500 years. Now, we favor using the scanning electron microscope. Uh, the reason for that is that it makes uh, the diatoms very easy to identify. And uh, we want to look at various different things on these images. Uh, so we look at pollen, uh, we look at diatoms. Uh, here, here is a sponge spicule. Here's another sponge. Uh, microfossil. Um, here are some decomposing plant materials. This is a diatom, diatoms, a lot of diatoms. Um, these images start out being black and white, uh, but one of my colleagues likes to colorize them. Mm -hmm. Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyway, here's. <laughs> so this is false color. But anyway, uh, this is um, a pine uh, pollen grain there, that's a pollen. So uh, we've gone through our uh, preparation, and we have a very easy way of collecting the microfossil. Uh, we take a gram from the core, and uh, we mix it up with five mils of a very strong uh, zinc chloride solution, and then we centrifuge it. The peat, the black organic rich peat very quickly settles down to the bottom of the test tube. The supernatant contains all of the microfossils, and this shows you a typical view on the SEM. Uh, this specimen here is 4,500 years old. So now I'm just going to show you quickly some example um, diatoms. Um, Sorry. So here we see um, some of our reference uh, diatoms. Uh, diatoms are preserved very well in peat because they have silica in their cell walls. Um, here is a fungal spore. Here is a dying flagellate. And we also see uh, those. Um, but what uh, we did in this study was identified to the species 112 uh, diatoms. 39 of them uh, were present at more than 2% of the numbers, and these are plotted on this diagram here. So along the bottom, the x-axis, you'll see that all of these divisions are the same. Here we see our depth age going down to 8,000 uh, years old and 5 meters. But because the x-axis is the same, you can visually look at this and you can compare the frequency of these different taxa. Another thing that we try to do is to group them into groups like this. And uh, if you look carefully at this, uh, be careful because the x-axis um, is not all the same, so you have to look at it with a critical eye. Uh, this diagram here is a little bit different in that um, we've read papers 
uh, where people look at lakes of the present day. They identify the diatoms that are there and they measure the pH. So we worked backwards. We said, well, if we found diatoms thousands of years ago in our peak profile, then perhaps that tells us by inference what the pH was at the surface of the bog at that time. So this particular uh, data set here uh, is by comparing data with a paper by Dixit et al. And I want to return to this uh, in a few minutes when I show you a summary slide. Now I would like to just show you some reference pictures of pollen. So again, we like the SEM because we get good details. Uh, there are several papers out there from studies around the world uh, where they can tell different species apart within the same genus because of good detail on their SEMs and we are hoping to be able to do this also. So here are just uh, some examples of the sort of pictures which uh, we can produce. So uh, there are some more and next are some more. So we, uh, we like uh, to use our SEM for uh, these reasons. But principally, it allows us to identify the diatoms to the species without too much trouble. So, um, as many others have done, uh, we've looked at these different genera, and uh, you can look at this and you can see um, the age increasing downwards here. And then again, be careful because uh, some of these are different. Uh, but this shows you the um, frequency of the different genera at different ages. Uh, basically, we've been looking a thousand years apart, uh, but more recently we're moving between those uh, time points. It's just going to take a while to do it. <coughs> the hemlock here you start 8,000 years ago, and then there's this famous hemlock decline, and uh, we've been looking more recently at that uh, more closely. Now, I have now uh, two summary diagrams. So, what we're trying to do is to take data sets from four master's theses and other studies that we've done. And um, we're trying to combine them uh, in ways uh, in order to try to understand the history of our study site. This is not going to be simple. Uh, so, um, this is one way uh, that we're representing the information. Here you see a number of genera, and again we've got old here to present day in this direction, and that these are recognized sort of climate changes which occurred over the Holocene time since, time since the last ice age. So we're trying to relate those to those broad climatic changes. Down here, um, we see um, Suga, which is uh, the hemlock. So you see it doing this. And then it's a decline. Oh, I'm the wrong one again. Uh, this is the Suga, the decline. At the same time, you see the pine is increasing. Now, the next slide uh, really uh, is my final summary slide. And uh, it's a little bit complicated, but that's because I'm starting to put different things onto these diagrams 
and we're producing lots of these and we're trying to understand the history of our area and it's just of course getting more and more complicated. So uh, let me start by trying to um, simplify this for you and uh, the purple one, well let's start with this one. Now uh, this is inferred pH uh, which is the same data that you saw on the previous slide. The purple one um, is also a very similar data set but instead of using Dixit et al. as our reference uh, we used a book by Camburn and Charles and you'll see that the two inferred uh, pH data sets have the same form but if you look at the pH axis here uh, there's a little bit of a discrepancy in the actual numbers uh, so we're not too sure why that is um, the light blue one here is a set of pH values which I actually measured on the core itself. So um, it's not the same because the inferred pH must be the pH that existed at the surface at the time, uh, whereas this actual pH here um, has to take into account thousands of years of um, activity by the bacteria and decomposition of the organic matter. And then finally, um, we have several of the different um, uh, arboreal uh, tree pollen species uh, presented there as well. So if you're interested in pound water pond and the plants that are there, uh, you start with a very uh, good 1999 paper in Rodora by Circe and Hickler. And uh, then uh, hopefully uh, you'll look at uh, some of the data which we've been collecting since then. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any questions, please? Yes, I, there's a paper from Harvard Forest that looks yes. at southern New England. Have you seen your data line up more or less with that? Uh, yes, um, uh, they're doing uh, light microscope work. Uh, we think uh, our approach, although a little bit different, um, does correspond uh, mainly with the work that that group is doing. Um, they are also looking at the hemlock decline, as we are, mm -hmm. and uh, we see the uh, correspondence with what they're doing. Um, they uh, um, do light microscope work. Uh, they probably are collecting more data than we are, so they're good papers. I think they attributed that pine change to Pinus banksiana transitioning to Pinus strobus. Um, we're hoping in the future to be able to differentiate between different species of pine, uh, but I don't have a data set on that at the moment. Yeah. You refer to the famous hemlock decline? Well, we think it's famous. A couple of years ago. Is that, has that been observed in a lot of data sets? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think uh, everybody sees that. And when, when is that decline? When is it starting to um, I'm not sure, but um, what's about 4,000 years ago or so. Um, there are several hypotheses uh, to do uh, with why that is. Um, some people say it's climate. Some people say it's insects or uh, disease. Um, I don't have a data set uh, for it yet, but one of the things we're working on at the moment uh, is that we've been measuring the diameters of the hemlock uh, pollen grains pre decline during the decline and post-decline, and uh, it changes. Um, so we're hoping that that will shed some light on what happened uh, to cause the and what decline. Yes? Can you pick out uh, fires by carbon layers? Um, I haven't uh, done any work like that. The, um, the peat um, is, of course, uh, quite uniform uh, once you get from the 
upper layer of decomposing material. And uh, one of the things we have done is to um, look at bacteria in the profile. Uh, this isn't anything to do with your question, of course. And um, uh, the bacterial assemblage, once you get into the peat, appears to be um, fairly constant all the way from the top down to the bottom, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yes, thank you.